Getting ready to buy or sell a home? Do you want to help support pro-life organizations? Then you need Real Estate for Life. Get a top-notch real estate agent and support pro-life causes. Go to realestateforlife.org to learn more. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Slava Jesus Christ. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we just celebrated, remembered uh, Remembrance Day this week. We had a beautiful Remembrance Day celebration in midweek. We still have the, uh, the um, wreaths up here and the flags as well as part of that service. And so I was thinking back on the virtues. You know, every, every uh, epic, every time that humanity has been around, We've always had different virtues that are displayed better in certain times than in other times. And I think if we can look back at the Great War, especially World War II, we see the virtue of courage spelled out in an incredible way. And that virtue, brothers and sisters, is a virtue that we, in our time, so desperately need. We need to be courageous. Well, we see in the gospel today fear and courage in all sorts of different ways. I've mentioned before that to go to the other side of the lake, which is what our Lord does in the boat today, was a terrible and fearful thing. On this side of the lake, it's nasha, to use a Ukrainian word, right? It's our people. We are, you know, at peace here. But who knows what we're going to find when we go into Gentile territory on the other side of that lake, right? And lo and behold, as they are going across the lake, if we could have rewound the gospel reading a little bit, we would have seen there was a terrible storm to the point where the disciples thought they were going to drown. It was that bad. And our Lord calms that storm with a single word. And when they arrive, they are not disappointed because they come face to face with real evil. A man who is so possessed by the devil that he refers to himself as legion, legion, the largest Roman military unit, a terrible and frightful image of how possessed this man is. He's naked, he rips apart the chains that are binding him, he accosts everyone in a violent way along the way, no one can control him. It's a terrifying image. And of course, we just heard the gospel, brothers and sisters, our Lord heals him. Our Lord drives those demons out into the swine that run down the cliff and die. They all drown. And we would think, you know, that the people coming in would take a look and see that our Lord has healed this man and that they would be overjoyed, that they would be welcoming him, that they would be absolutely elated that this had happened. But what do they tell him? Get lost, right? So few words. Get out of here. They are terrified of who this man is. The only person who is begging him to stay, right, is the man who is healed. The man who is healed, the unnamed man, his name is never given in the gospel, just begs that the Lord will take him with, with him. Right? Let me be with you. Now, the real courage, right? We've seen courage all the way through, right? The courage of the disciples as they turn to the Lord. We've seen the, the fearfulness, right? The other side of courage from the people and from, uh, from the disciples, whatever the case is. But the real courage is displayed in this man. Because our Lord says to him, no, stay here. And instead of coming with me, Share with everyone the good that the Lord has done in your life, the amazing gifts that you've been given by God. Now imagine the courage that that would take. This man is responsible for the economic collapse of this entire region, essentially. And he goes out and proclaims the good news of what it is that the Lord has done. He does not keep it to himself. Tremendous courage, brothers and sisters. Tremendous courage. Today, we also remember the life of a saint who also displays tremendous courage. 
we've heard his, his name a million times. John Chrysostom, right? It's always mentioned at the end of a divine liturgy because he wrote, he compiled, he redacted the, uh, the final version of the liturgy that we have uh, today. It's attributed to him. So it's the called the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. We ask for his intercession uh, at the very end of it as well if uh, within the priestly prayers. But St. John Chrysostom, maybe you've heard his name, maybe you've tripped over his name. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Chrysostom, it's not actually his name. It's kind of his honorific nickname. It means golden mouth, golden mouth. And in this church, we are blessed with having this iconographic stained glass window right here of St. John Chrysostom who I feel bad that you don't really ever get to sort of see him the way I see him, uh, because he's always staring me down in the middle of the homily, right? Which, which is good, because he was called Chrysostom, golden mouth, because he was a fiery preacher. He was gifted with the ability to touch people's hearts through his preaching. If he preached for less than an hour, people were upset. They felt like they had been shortchanged. And so when he is here, you know, he always reminds me not to pull my punches with you uh, because he was such a fiery preacher, such a good preacher. He was born, brothers and sisters, in 347 in Antioch. He was raised as a Christian and baptized at the age of 18 by Miletius, the patriarch of Antioch. And he loved the Lord so much that he wanted to make a special devotion to him by becoming a hermit. He wanted to go and live in the desert and pray and fast and forsake the world and forsake marriage and just simply be there with the Lord, right? We hear the echoes of that in the gospel, right? Let me be with you, that unnamed man says to the Lord, right? Well, that's what St. John wanted to do. And he fasted so hard, brothers and sisters, he was so zealous that he actually wound up causing damage to his own kidneys because of the extreme austere life that he led. Later on in his writings, he'll go back and lament that. He'll say, I should have been more prudent. But it's not that that zeal was bad. That zeal was a good thing. He just wasn't prudent in the way that he was living it out. He would be ordained a deacon. He would serve as a deacon for six years uh, by the priest Flavian who was Miletus' uh, successor. And he, as I mentioned already, he was given this incredible gift through his preaching to touch hearts. Many, many, many people came, packed the churches that he was preaching at. They all wanted to hear what it was that he was saying because they could hear the Lord's voice through John's preaching. He opened up to them the scriptures. And it's a good reminder for us that the liturgy that bears his name, the one that we're celebrating right now, has these two tables. The table of the word, where we open up the scriptures. We break open the scriptures. That's what the preaching is meant to do. And it's intimately related to the second table, the holy altar, where we receive the body and blood of our Lord in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so, brothers and sisters, he was preaching as a priest and as a deacon when finally he was ordained a bishop and he became the patriarch of Constantinople in 397. And his fiery preaching was something that was not appreciated by his own priests in his own eparchy. You see, they were used to living a very extravagant royal life and he came in, shook everything up and actually demanded, of all things, that his priests be holy, that they be holy. That they start to live a life that represented the gospel, not their own self-interest. He went so far as to sell some of the furniture in the patriarchal residence so that he could found a hospital with that money and take care of the poor and the destitute. And so his witness earned him some enemies. Finally, brothers and sisters, when the empress herself, Eudoxia at that time, erected a statue of herself next to the church, it was the final straw for St. John. He said that Herodias was dancing once again in front of Herod, right? a reference to the gospel. And he was exiled, got on the wrong side of the empress, he was sent away. 
But the Lord still continued to even work in that. She didn't send him far enough away. And people were still coming to the faith, still packing churches, still coming to him because of the incredible witness that he gave through his preaching, through his life, the courage that he showed. Finally, she sent him even further away, and on the way, because of the, the, uh, his old age and his ill health, and because of the, uh, the austere life he'd led before, he died on that march. He died, essentially marched to death for the faith. His last words were, glory to God for all things. Glory to God for all things. Even in death, he could witness to the Lord. Well, how, brothers and sisters, do we appropriate courage like that? How is it that we take St. John Chrysostom off the page, we don't leave him there in the history book, but emulate what he has done? I would recommend three things. Number one, reconfigure your fear. Reconfigure your fear. We see fear throughout the gospel. They are afraid of the wind. They are afraid of the demon-possessed man. They are afraid of, of their economy being destroyed and this, this powerful prophet remaining with them. We should be afraid, brothers and sisters, primarily and firstly of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, I'm not saying being afraid of, of him as if he were some tyrant, or being afraid of him as if he were some slave master. But there's another word for good and holy fear of the Lord, and that's reverence. We should be reverent. We should have the Lord's awesome power and might, his incredible love for us as the center of our lives. And that love is demanding. Our God, as we read, is a jealous God. He doesn't just want part of us. He doesn't just want our leftovers. He wants all of us. So reconfigure your fear. Put the fear of the Lord at the center of your life. It will lead to wisdom, brothers and sisters. The second thing is related to that, and that is to persevere in prayer. Persevere in prayer. St. John never gives up throughout the turbulent witness that he gives. He continually prays. And this is what he says about prayer praying continually. As he is reflecting on your will be done in Matthew 6, that's part of the Our Father, he says this, If you are heard praying, continue to give thanks in prayer. If you are not heard, remain praying so that you may be heard. God protects you with the pretexts of need so that you may converse with him more closely and devote yourself to prayer. Persevere in prayer, brothers and sisters. Never forsake that. And number three, practice talking about your faith. Practice talking about your faith. I'm sure you've heard the expression attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel always and sometimes use words, right? That's all fine and good, brothers and sisters. I think it's true. But St. Francis used a whole lot of words when he needed to in order to preach the gospel. We can't use that saying as a pretext to say, preach the gospel always, but never talk about it. We need, brothers and sisters, to talk about our faith. There is a lie in the world that says something along the lines of, your faith is a private thing. Go ahead and do it whenever you want. Just leave me out of it and the rest of the world. That is false, brothers and sisters. It is not true. and We need to live this incredible, courageous witness that we have been given. How do you practice that? In simple ways that are low uh, stress, right? Someone said, uh, I asked a friend, you know, I just have a hard time saying no to people sometimes. That's what I said to this, this man. Uh, and he said, that's easy. Just wait for the next telemarketer to call you and then practice saying no to him. And he was absolutely right, right? It's a completely low stakes uh, scenario. Nothing is gonna happen to me if I say no there. And I can say no politely. But the same principle works the other way around. Find opportunities 
where you can bring up the Lord's name in conversation. Find opportunities where you can speak about some God moment that you had that week in a place where it's safe, in a place where it's easy. And the good news is we practice successively in those safe environments. It will get easier to be able to raise up to the level where we are like this unmanned name in the gospel who is preaching the word when it is difficult. Or St. John Chrysostom, who refuses to quench the message despite the resistance that he finds. Brothers and sisters, today the Lord reveals himself as he who is able to save. Let us reconfigure our fear and pray for the courage to fully engage with the incredible mission that we have been given. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Slava Jesus Christ. Glory be to Jesus Christ.